I want to see the tsunami that we have to move up for. It's a pretty <laughs> Sounds like an asteroid uh, uh, Greetings, everyone. Uh, yeah, I'm Eric Dahlstrom with uh, the Space Base, which is uh, uh, me and my wife, Emily, are part of Space Base along with the third co founder in, in uh, California. And our project here, as Edmund Hillary follows, is to uh, help uh, space entrepreneurs in New Zealand and help build a space community. And so, uh, We'll, we have a number of projects that Emily will be talking about uh, uh, later on. Um, also, you might want to note this uh, Bitly address, which has, uh, which is where we have PDFs of our charts. Uh, it's uh, it's case sensitive, um, but uh, uh, anyway, that's uh, where for me and Emily, where our, our charts are at. Whoa, how did that happen? Okay, uh, I've been having weird problems with this PowerPoint. Well, anyway, um, so uh, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about my background, which uh, uh, I worked as a space engineer for many years. Uh, um, and uh, my background is unusual, and also Emily's background is unusual. We'll, we'll tell you non standard stories here. Um, but this is the, uh, I started out in in, a, in uh, I started out in physics and astronomy, and then went into space engineering, and uh, worked on space station design for about eight years. Uh, and uh, you might imagine that I go in a straight line like this, but you never go in a straight line in, <laughs> in these projects. Uh, and uh, uh, and it's even more so, more true about the future of uh, space activities. And so these are some of the other jobs I took along the way, um, including like uh, being a game developer or a journalist or a reliability engineer or a, a, program, a professor and things like that. Um, you, you, you left out astronaut. <laughs> yeah. Not yet. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a story about where my, why my astronaut application was rejected. So I, I talked to the communists about a U.S. shuttle visiting the Mir space station before it was popular. <laughs> Got an FBI file for that. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, so, uh, sorry about the flaky uh, PowerPoint. Um, uh, so anyway, uh, uh, I followed basically a lot of different projects, whatever was interesting at, at the time. And so, so I started in, in physics with black holes and uh, worked in, on the Cosmic Background Explorer to look at the uh, origin of the universe and worked on the infrared astronomy satellite uh, mapping the galaxy and mapping the galaxy in the radio. Uh, but uh, uh, I also uh, got hired to be a uh, basically an IT consultant to uh, the space station office at NASA Goddard. Um, and there I... Uh, I learned a lot about the space station, and at the time, uh, the the uh, NASA Langley uh, contractors uh, for space station were trying to hire people, and so they hired me because of my knowledge about space station, even though I was not an engineer. And so, but I ended up uh, with a, applying my physics background to uh, to the engineering work at the NASA Langley Space Station office while I scrambled to get an engineering degree at the on the side. So, you know, I was a senior engineer before I took an engineering course, which was really scary. <laughs> Especially if I built a bridge or something. Um, so the things I worked on at, uh, at the Space Station office uh, at NASA Langley, um, we had two roles. We were the evolution office, I don't know what to do with this thing. Um, uh, we, but we also studied the future evolution of. Uh, we studied the future evolution of space station. But we also looked at the uh, uh, technical assessment and giving advice to NASA headquarters. Uh, so um, we had 50 engineers that specialized in different subsystems, and I was one of the two engineers that uh, had an open charter look at any uh, uh, any subsystem. 
So that was a wonderful job to be on, on the space station. So I was involved with all these. Uh, for a while, all we did was redesign the space station over and over and over again. Uh, we, we managed to spend, uh, the original cost of space station was estimated to be $8 billion. We spent $8.5 billion before we built any hardware. So uh, one of the things I worked on was the early uh, conceptual design of the, uh, uh, of the docking tunnel between the U.S. and, and Russian systems. And uh, so I always feel like some ownership about those little tunnels. Uh, if I see them in the movie, Gravity, it was like, oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, and this is uh, about what the space station looks like, uh, although this, this vehicle returned to Earth, and this is the one that has the, the patched hole in it. Um, and uh, so the, the, the tunnel we worked on was, was the first connection between the U.S. and Russian systems. And here's the uh, 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 video of the uh, assembly sequence. Um, it's almost 20 years since the first part was launched uh, in November of 1998. Um, <coughs> keep in mind that every piece that comes up is coming up on either the shuttle or, the, or a proton launch or a European or Japanese vehicle. And it's costing, uh, in the shuttle case, $1.6 billion for delivery. And so, um, so the, these parts, uh, so it adds up to be about $150 billion when the original estimate was $8 billion. Um, we always assumed uh, in our designs that one of the first things up would be the, uh, the windows to look at uh, and control the, uh, the assembly. But actually the window uh, cupola was about the last piece that was added. And so all this was done all this assembly was done uh, using uh, video cameras and uh, television cameras on the arm and all done uh, uh, almost blind by the uh, astronauts inside. Uh, the, the Japanese module uh, didn't dis change its design since the early days. Everybody else, uh, the Europeans and U.S., and shrank their modules down so the, US, the Japanese used to be the smallest module, then they ended up being the biggest one, just because they didn't change the design. And there, finally, the windows arrive. So there's still plans to add on uh, pieces. The Russians have some pieces to add on. The, uh, uh, the plans to add on uh, attached vehicles on the front. There's arguments over uh, who gets to add on what. And, uh, uh, but this is basically what it looks like inside. Uh, it looks like outside. It's uh, uh, 109 meters from one side to another, about 420 tons. And uh, uh, the interior pressurized volume is, is you know, like uh, Airbus 3, 380. And so uh, you, uh, uh, so one thing that's funny is that the six astronauts that are normally on board, they rarely see each other while they're working. They, they only get together for dinner. Um, and, and actually, they hardly ever see the Russians until on the weekend when they go visit the Russian site. <laughs> here they are assembling the truss over, uh, over New Zealand here. So we, we did have some failures of imagination. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the, uh, the interior is designed for the be able to move these 500 kilogram racks, uh, and uh, but uh, after 20 years worth of experiments, you know the cables just got out of hand, and so they're having entire armies of people that only do that only try to keep track of where the astronauts have put something. They've they've lost uh, things that are about this big before. They can't find <laughs> what they did with that pump. So this is, uh, uh, Emily will show this more in the, when she talks about her experience, uh, but this is a general overview of, and there's, the only message I wanted to share here was there's a lot of commercial activity that's starting in the past, past few years. 
and uh, and this is leading toward uh, an explosion of activity that's going to be happening in the next two years. Um, and the big picture reason why all this is happening is uh, exponential technologies. Um, uh, this is uh, uh, basically this ordinary phone is equal to 60 Cray su two supercomputers. Um, so um, the entire the entire uh, uh, processing power that the Pentagon had during the Cold War is uh, less than one phone. Um, and, uh, and so there is an agreement in the app iPhone uh, operating system when you, um, when you uh, turn on your phone for the first time, it says you have to click through, yes, you will not use your phone to design nuclear weapons. <laughs> or the Apple lawyers will get you. <laughs> um, and so, uh, application of these uh, powerful technologies is um, embedded in CubeSats, for example. Um, CubeSats started out as uh, a form factor to, just as a uh, sort of the minimum uh, uh, example of a spacecraft that you could build, and it was used as a, as a training system in, in engineering schools. Uh, and and but then it got wider and wider application because people realized you could put really powerful systems into these cube sets. And so uh, uh, these are some remote sensing spacecraft going down to Planet Labs uh, cube sets, which are it's a three U three unit uh, cube set which is mainly a telescope uh, pointing at the Earth. And uh, can you find the the set? The spacecraft. Mm. This is their first one. It's it's sitting over here on the on the table. Uh, so it's about the size of a coffee cup, and you can see that they're they're producing them in bulk, um, and they're using uh, agile development systems. So they're actually on uh, about their twentieth version of their their uh, spacecraft, and so. Uh, one time they had a launch failure, they lost 26 of these things at once, and it didn't bother them. It was sort of like Apple losing a box of iPhone 4s. They said, oh, don't worry, we're on the next generation, we don't care. So, uh, so the planet uh, now has about, um, I think about 250 of these things in orbit, and uh, is looking at uh, uh, mapping the Earth every day with food security, environmental disaster response. Um, they're often the ones that, if you look at an article about what North Korea is doing with their facilities, it's uh, planet imagery. Um, here is, uh, you can see the launches over time. Just in the last few years, planet has exploded the, uh, the number of satellites being launched. Um, this is them packaging the satellites. Uh, they've launched 80, 80 of them at once on this Indian satellite, and uh, this thing just shows some of the uh, their CubeSats being tossed out by the, by the uh, uh, launch vehicle. And the whole point is to, uh, to create this line scan system uh, where you, the CubeSat allows you to put these sensors distributed through the orbit and, uh, and allow you to image the entire Earth uh, every day. Uh, and so here's this little, tiny little CubeSat uh, taking images continuously. Um, this is their test launch, uh, test deployment from the space station. So there's other, um, other exponential technologies. Now that uh, chips are fast enough to do high frequency electronics, um, you can replace the electronics in a big tracking station with um, with this little guy. Um, so it's actually all the smarts are in this chip right here, and the chip is operating fast enough so it can actually process in real time the uh, the frequencies that are um, that are coming down. So you can you can tune this to all sorts of different uh, uh, radio frequencies and uh, and Spire. Uh, is using that to track ships in the middle of the ocean. Uh, this is another example. I worked on this uh, hyperspectral sensor for Raytheon, $700 million, 
half a ton um, has now been replaced by one chip. Uh, it's still expensive, fifty thousand dollars, but it's you can put this on a drone. You can. Um, they're flying this an aircraft right now over uh, in New Zealand to to map the health of uh, vineyards. Um, this thing, by the way. Uh, went over budget and, and behind schedule and canceled the entire seven million dollar program it was on. But what you can do with hyperspectral uh, imagery is that you can actually detect the species of plant that you're looking at. And so uh, there's potential in the next few years to map all the, the uh, uh, invasive species in New Zealand uh, based using hyperspectral imagery. Uh, another uh, 3D, uh, another um, exponential technology is, is are 3D printers. Um, these are some students of Emily and myself when they were developing a project to uh, create this company made in space. Um, they tested the, the 3D printers on the on the uh, uh, parabolic flights. Um, then they delivered two printers to the space station um, where they. Uh, can surprise astronauts with a, a wrench, that, for example. It's it's great because they it's like a microwave, but you, the astronauts don't know what's inside until they open it up. <laughs> oh, my wrench! <laughs> and then, uh, uh, and now, uh, um, I think this coming year they'll be testing a uh, outside 3D printer on the space station to build uh, really giant structures in space. And so. Um, if you, you know, have a chance to go to a hotel in space, it might be built by a 3D printer, and so you might be the, the first one to get there and open it up, and you, you find the hotel is completely built. So we'll see if that works. <laughs> but here's, here's another of their, their wrenches, a uh, little, uh, right now they're just demonstrating with plastic uh, interior. They have, a, a, I think, three material printer. And uh, they're also doing a um, uh, printing, uh, uh, fiber optics that they're for delivery on the Earth because it's a hundred times more pure fiber optics. Uh, also, something that's coming up is there are about three, maybe five companies that are competing to provide internet to the entire world from lower orbit constellations, and so um, they're all competing to provide gigabit speeds anywhere in the in the world at which. I imagine we'll make remote parts of New Zealand property even more valuable if you can just be sitting in the mountain and, and connected. Um, but anyway, it's it's a uh, these are uh, maybe uh, maybe five years away, but it's uh, uh, it's also a, uh, one reason why people are investing in things like Rocket Lab to to launch uh, because uh, you may launch a batch of these things on together on a big vehicle, but then to replace missing ones or failed satellites, <coughs> launch them uh, into the specific spots with, uh, with small launch vehicles. So uh, with the uh, exponential technologies, it's got uh, tremendous opportunity for all these small companies and creating uh, uh, niche markets but they're also the big companies are also have really big plans based on using these, these uh, what the new technology will give you, and uh, there's uh, SpaceX and Blue Origin. Uh, Blue, uh, you may have seen a lot of with SpaceX activity. Blue Origin is doing even bigger things. They just are very quiet about it, um, and uh, even uh, United Launch Alliance, uh, Lockheed and Boeing have really big plans. They expect in 30 years have a need to have a thousand people out at the moon just to refuel the vehicles for their, um, for their, uh, to move satellites around. And so uh, all these things are, are in some ways much bigger than uh, NASA plans or European Space Agency plans or things like that. So we have, um, Blue Origin is working on these uh, vehicles. We saw this in uh, in their factory in Seattle, and they're building their, their uh, assembly facility in Florida. Um, 
and they uh, and SpaceX is starting to work on their uh, VFS VFR. Uh, here are some tanks for it. Um, the Falcon Heavy launch. Um, oh, here we are. Uh, Falcon Heavy itself can do 60 tons to space, which is about like a, how much a C-17 can carry to Antarctica. And so, um, while these big projects go on in the world, um, they are the delivery system. Uh, and so, just like uh, New Zealand has a huge amount of activity in, in Antarctica, they don't operate the, they don't build and operate the planes. They get a ride on them, and that, but they. Uh, but the entire New Zealand Ar Antarctic base and activity and all the researchers just happen to use that ride. And so um, I think the same kind of thing is going to be happening with these big uh, space rockets. That there's, it really opens up uh, activity for uh, uh, what you can do. And um, uh, it doesn't mean that you have to be the one to build the rockets. Um, for the big rockets, the, the new trend is to uh, reuse or land the, the booster phrase and, um, and, uh, and reuse the rocket, which is, it, so it's a tremendous transformation because it's, it, if you just picture how much air travel would you do if you threw away the airplane after each flight. Uh, and so this is something that changes from, you know, $90 million down to uh, $7 million or less. and. Uh, and so it, it's, uh, it enables a lot of, of activity. Um, and that's why, like even, you know, Elon thinks that you can do point-to-point um, -point and replace aircraft, you know, uh, so you can fly from uh, New Zealand to New York in 30 minutes, uh, screaming the entire way. <laughs> <laughs> so, so here's the uh, Falcon Heavy landing. Um, uh, where they uh, landed two boosters at the same time. Uh, so these boosters are about 23 stories tall. Uh, and uh, so then, um, so we have the the big the big uh, Falcon 9 and Falcon Heavy and even larger vehicles being designed or usable. Um, they're sort of eliminating these scale uh, vehicles. Uh, at, uh, Lockheed Martin is, and at, is really worried about their Atlas. Uh, Electron is a different, uh, there's no plan for usability yet, but it's uh, manufactured at very quick and low cost. And, uh, and so um, we're waiting on the third flight uh, and uh, uh, Peter Beck has said that he expects 16 flights next year. So we should start to see the activity really pick up. Um, and so hopefully I can get out to the beach and watch one sometime. Um, there's, uh, I was also, uh, at one point I was manager of the lunar lander for Moon Express, and uh, the design changed several times, uh, and, but he does, uh, Moon Express has bought three rides on uh, Electron for, um, that uh, going towards the moon. Um, so there's a, a huge number of companies that are being created in the last few years. Uh, $16 billion of investment in, for the entrepreneurs. These are entrepreneurial space companies. You can't read them, but on the, uh, if you download the charts, you can. And uh, uh, so it's a, it's a great time to uh, create a company uh, to be working on uh, develop and getting ready for these big projects. Um, uh, one thing that I learned through my experience is that um, people I, I you know, went to school with or worked with um, one project, I kept coming back and encountering them on other projects. And so there's one guy I worked with at school. Um, uh, I've worked for him. He worked for me uh, four different times. Uh, and uh, if you want a uh, power beaming system on the space station, he's the guy to see. So uh, anyway, it's, it's, um, it's, it's really bizarre how people that you, you know, form an opinion of from a study project, uh, you end up uh, making a decision about their career later on. Uh, 
So uh, you have um, these big projects out here, uh, but there's a whole lot of, uh, uh, basically these big co companies are working just on transportation system. Um, everything else uh, needs to be filled in. Everything you, you think of for a, a large number of people on the moon or, or uh, going out to the asteroids. Um, so there's a lot of activity about to happen on the moon. Um, one projection is ten, next 10 years, maybe 50 missions. Uh, and uh, there's all these different, uh, Europe has a big project. Um, uh, the US is, is starting to issue contracts of a, a lunar orbiting space station. Um, other people have designs for, uh, for sending humans there. Um, uh, and uh, even uh, SpaceX, even though Elon's focused on Mars, he also has pictures of sending 100 people at a time to the moon. Um, I never thought you'd see a winged vehicle landing on the moon, but maybe, but his, he thinks his design will work that way. Uh, and this is the, uh, the concept of the interior of uh, with the uh, uh, cabin crews. And part the reason for the moon going to the moon is the lunar resources, things like uh, iron and titanium, oxygen, silicon, things that you need raw materials for building a base uh, or or solar arrays or or things like that, and also about a billion tons of water at the poles. Um, about the uh, the quantity of water is in the in Wellington Harbor here, and so um, one uh, uh, one container worth you know, uh, um, uh, of, of water, like a, uh, a a shipping container, is enough to rocket fuel to to transport things off the moon. Um, but you need power to uh, uh, to do that. And uh, one of the companies we work with, we're working with in New Zealand, is a uh, startup that is wants to provide, wants to make solar arrays on the moon lunar surface. So maybe the, uh, uh, and, and part of the motivation here is that it's easier to get things off the moon into um, even to Earth orbit than it is to, from the surface of the Earth. And one big application is, is building uh, solar power satellites and transmitting it to Earth. Uh, so you create a a large amount of energy without uh, uh, without global warming. Um, so I'd love to see uh, the the uh, solar system energy system taken over by a New Zealand company. Uh, here's a, a lucky uh, design. They're building this vehicle now that's going to be able to land sideways on the moon. Uh, and one area that we're probably going to be more familiar with in the future is. Uh, the peculiar orbit arrangement, gravity field of orbiting around the, uh, the Earth-Moon system, where you can actually cycle between uh, these uh, stable points. And so you have um, uh, these Lagrange libration points, you can uh, actually move between fairly easily, and uh, uh, only uh, meters per, uh, tens of meters per second move between these things instead of uh, thousands to go in a direct orbit. So here's one vision of the future of uh, Patrick Collins uh, where he imagined uh, if you got the price low enough with these reusable rockets uh, to get five million people a year into space, which is only two percent of the tourism market for, for space according to the surveys. Um, and so, uh, I, uh, one thing is that is that every uh, every weekend the uh, uh, the tourists of the world spend more than than all the space government space budgets of the world. Um, and we will talk more about the tourism aspect of this. Uh, but every everything you, you need for these massive enterprises, which may be like only uh, ten or fifteen years away. Um, you need things like food production, you need uh, health monitors, you need everything you think of you know, on Earth, you need to, to make a, a replication in space. And, the, and these 
big companies are only looking at um, the transportation side. So they're, they're leaving it 